All right, we get to start a brand new unit about plants. So uh, let's see, there's lots of mutually beneficial, so things that benefit each other, that we call symbioses. So it's together, life. So there's life that's kind of close together. Uh, and that's typically between plants and fungi, and that began millions of years ago uh, when plants first occupied land. And these really close associations allow plants to tap into a vast underground network of fungal filaments. Because you may not realize it, but there's a lot of fungi throughout the ground. You can see like a mushroom come up, but there's all this nice network underneath the ground that we'll talk about. Anyways, there's a thing called mycorrhizae that we'll talk about later that they form this nice association with. And we'll get more to that at the end of this particular unit. But we've got to know about the plants first. Like, how can we actually get nutrients from the environment? So how does the uh, fungi contribute uh, to getting more nutrients to plants, like these coffee beans, my favorite? Okay, we're not going to do a whole lot this, uh, this section. We're just going to look at the evolution and the diversity. So we're going to have two essential questions. Is we're going to talk about, oops wrong letter. How did plants evolve? Okay. And the other thing that we're going to look at is how do we classify plants? And we'll look at some really broad categories and we could talk about those next time. So how did plants evolve and how do we classify them? So more than 500 million years ago, the algal ancestors of plants, which we know algae are kind of protists, just to kind of bring it back to the stuff that we tried to brain dump already, but those protists, um, like archaeplastids, okay, uh, really give rise to plants. And these guys may have carpeted kind of moist fringes of lakes and maybe coastal kind of salt marshes. So plants are green algae are called um, charophytes. Okay. They have thought to evolve from a common ancestor, have complex multicellular bodies, and the big thing is they're photosynthetic eukaryotes. So they have a nucleus and they make their own food using light. Some species accumulated adaptations that enabled them to live permanently above the water line. And that's the stuff that we talk about a little bit later on. Okay, so there's a charophyte to kind of get started. We could think about uh, green algae kind of looks this way too. Just some similarities. And it gives us a nice little cross section of I think a bryophyte here. So just some kind of early kind of less complex plants. So life on land has offered lots of opportunities for plant adaptations. So plants will actually take advantage of unlimited sunlight Lots of CO2, which remember is that's how we make uh, sugars through photosynthesis, so we need the CO2. And initially, there weren't that many pathogens or herbivores. So remember way back before then, we didn't have plants on land, so we didn't have plant eaters, and we didn't really have plant diseases yet. So it was a good place to go to move on land. However, it did have some of its disadvantages. On land, they had to maintain moisture inside their cells to keep from drying out. Because if you're on land, the potential to not have a water source actually is great. Okay. They actually have to support their body in a non-buoyant medium, which means that they can't just float on top of the water and be okay. They've actually got to support themselves. They have to reproduce and disperse offspring without water. Okay. They've got to anchor their bodies into the soil and obtain resources from soil and air. So as these things kind of go on, this actually kind of gives us an idea about how they evolved. So they first had to maintain moisture. Then they had to support themselves. Then they had to reproduce and disperse. And so this is kind of the order that we're going to go in for the rest of this little lecture, just talking about different types of plants. All right, so unlike land plants, algae really didn't have rigid tissues. 
they were really supported by surrounding water. If you've seen algae in pools, you know that you don't typically see algae outside of kind of a like a an aquatic type environment. They can obtain CO2 and other minerals directly from the water surrounding the entire algal body. They receive light and perform photosynthesis over most of their body. And they use flagellated sperm to fertilize the eggs. So the flagella can move through the water. And that will help disperse offspring by water. So we're going to look at this kind of evolutionarily. And what you'll see is that here's kind of a, an alga that we might have looked at. And so it's got flagellated sperm, and it only kind of distributes through the water. As we move up towards land, we'll have things that actually have to support themselves, but they'll be kind of short. Um, we'll have a little bit further on, we'll have things that kind of disperse by spores, and they'll be a little bit taller and can support themselves. And then we move all the way up to these kind of complex things that both support themselves and can use wind pollination in different ways than just kind of, you know, hoping these tiny spores catch wind. So we'll kind of look at that progression over this lecture. So land plants actually maintain their moisture and their cells using a waxy cuticle, and they regulate the opening and closing of stomata. So I'm going to draw a simple little picture. Here's like a leaf. We might have talked about these a little bit whenever we did um, photosynthesis, but these are obviously giant holes here. They'd be a lot smaller in a real plant. But these holes allow gas exchange, so that way we can let O2 out and we can let CO2 in. Okay, so we can open and close those particular stomata to allow regulation of what, um, what gases come in and out. Land plants obtain water and minerals from the roots in the soil. They obtain CO2 from the air and sunlight from the leaves. This really shouldn't be new information from you, for you. Like the waxy cuticle is a little bit new. It's just kind of a wax that coats it. We'll have a little reminder on what those stomata are, but these things about plants use water and CO2 and sunlight, you should know this part. If you don't, talk to me, but we should know that. <laughs> Here's a different part though, something you definitely won't know, but growth producing regions of cell division, so cell division is how we grow, and these are called apical meristems, because they're part of the stem and they form an apex, it's strange, but they're apical meristems and they're just the regions where cell division and growth actually happens. They're really only found at the tips of uh, stems and the tips of roots because plants tend to grow up and they tend to grow down. There's a little bit of kind of spreading either way, but we're more focused on the upgrowth and the downgrowth. So when they're at what we call the apex or the top, and you could flip it over and think of the bottom, it's kind of like the top for the roots. So the top or the apex is what's growing, and those would be apical meristems. In many land plants, Water and minerals move up from the roots and stem using what's called vascular tissue. Uh, vascular just kind of means, um, oh, what was I going to say about vascular? This is how you can tell that it's a little bit later at night and I'm tired. Uh, vascular is kind of like a tubing or, like we, we say that you have a cardiovascular system. So the cardio is the heart. Vascular is like the vessels. There we go. So it's kind of vessels. Oh, my dog's decided to join the electric elephant. Go away. <laughs> so they're vessels where we're going to have kind of water and stuff move. So xylem is actually what, it's mainly dead cells, but it moves water and minerals. So xylem tends to go up because, remember, roots pick up water. Pick up, take in, water, whatever. So uh, water it comes in from the roots, so the xylem tend to go up because we're going to take water and minerals from the roots up. All right. Phloem doesn't necessarily go up. It just conveys sugars. So sugars, remember, we need for energy. So I kind of say it like this, is that the xylem tends to take things up. The phloem tends to take 
sugars out to where they're needed. And that could be down, it could be to the sides, it just kind of takes it out where we need to, to utilize energy. Okay. Because sugars, even for plants, they make their own sugars, but they still need to break those sugars down to be able to get energy to grow or produce things. Okay, and these guys are usually living cells. All right, so lovely little pictures of the vessels. So for the vascular kind of tissues, they're vessels. And typically for us, when we look at plants, vascular plants are the ones that stand upright. So there you go. And we'll, we'll look at those comparisons a little bit later. All right, we're at the 10 minute mark. This is a great place to take a break. So take a break and then come back. All right, cell walls of some plant tissues, including xylem, are thickened and reinforced by a chemical called lignin. Uh, so we call, so lignin kind of helps the cell wall. So it's going to be a little bit tougher or harder, a little thickened. The absence of lignified cell walls and mosses and other plants uh, are considered to have a lack of vascular tissue, and that limits their height. When you don't have a tough, thickened substance uh, to reinforce the kind of plant tissues, it just means that they're going to be shorter. And again, we'll look at plenty of examples of these to help clear it up a little bit. I say a little bit shorter, but they're, they're a lot shorter. So these, by the way, are, like I said, mosses. Those things are very low to the ground. So in all plants, we've got gametes and embryos that must be kept moist, so they still have to have some kind of water there. We need fertilized eggs or zygotes to develop into an embryo while attached and nourished by the parent plant. The life cycle involves an alternation of a haploid generation, which produces egg and sperm, and then a diploid generation, which produces spores, okay, and a protective uh, structure called the sporangia. Angia is kind of referring to producer, and um, that may not be the actual definition, but if we're producing spores and a protective structure, so this is the spore producer structure, so it's a sporangia. All right, so pines and flowering plants have pollen grains, which are structures that allow, um, that contain sperm producing cells. Okay. So pollen is what will help make the kind of uh, male gametes for the plant. All right, so those are kind of some basics, and we'll touch on some of those things along the way. So if you don't have that all straighten your brain right now, that's fine. We've got more time that we'll spend a little bit slower on those. These are the big things though. These are our four adaptations which will get us into our four different classifications of life, or not of life, of plants rather. So four key adaptations. Okay, We've got dependent embryos are present in all plants. So the embryos do actually depend on the parent to give them, or the parent plant to give them nutrients and other kinds of things that they would need, mainly nutrients, to get started. So that's kind of the first thing that arises. The second thing that we see arise is lignified vascular tissues. So a tougher tissue that can make them stand upright. Okay. So these are the plants that can actually stand upright on their own, defy gravity, if you will. Okay. The third one our seeds are found in a lineage, includes all living gymnosperms and angiosperms, and dominates the um, plant kingdom. So the third one really is seeds. Okay. And then the last and final thing that we see evolutionary, uh, evolutionarily is the development of flowers. And so we're going to look at each of these four categories as far as four different plant types are concerned. And you can see some of these things here. Here's land plants and where they come along. So the ancestral kind of algal species gives rise to liverworts and mosses and hornworts. And these are all non-vascular, what we call the bryophytes. So they don't have that lignified uh, vascular tissue. So these guys are all very short. 
and they're very low to the ground. Okay. Then a little bit later on, we start to get some vascular tissue, and we'll get some club mosses, we'll get some ferns and things, and those are all really cool. And then later on, okay, so closer to now, we'll get gymnosperms and angiosperms, which both produce seeds, but then this one will produce its flowers. So that's sort of how you can see the phylogenetic tree at work there. Okay, one more time. So early diversification of plants gave rise to seedless, non-vascular plants. So we call them the seedless, non-vascular plants, also known as bryophytes. You'll need to know that one. My dog is thirsty. I'm, sorry. I'm in a different location today. I usually make these videos at a desk, and today I didn't feel like getting out of the living room, so that's where I'm at. So, you know, the dogs are here with all their business. <laughs> anyway, so we got seedless non-vascular plants, which means they don't have seeds and they don't have vascular tissues. Bryophytes includes mosses, liverworts, and hornworts. You're more typically going to find mosses. Okay. Bryophytes resemble other plants in having, they do have these apical meristems, so they're going to grow at the top and at the bottom. And they have embryos retained in the parent plant. So they do actually still have embryos that are dependent on the parent, but they really don't have roots or leaves or lignified cell walls. They don't have those things. They haven't made it there. But we say that they're kind of simple or it doesn't work, but obviously this is working for them if they're still around. There's still plenty of, uh, of mosses, liverworts, and hornworts to, to occupy these spaces. So whatever it is that they're doing, Evolutionarily, we can say it works because they're not extinct yet. Okay, the second thing that we have evolved uh, was about 425 million years ago, and these are just vascular plants. And so they've got that lignin hearted vascular tissue. Seedless vascular plants include lycophytes, which we call club mosses, but really the one that we know best is probably the manilophytes, and these are ferns. So that's probably our best example there. There are a lot of really cool ferns to look at. When I did research and I had to be in a greenhouse all the time, somebody accidentally introduced a fern into the greenhouse and because it was wonderful conditions, there was no way to ever get rid of a fern. It's amazing. <laughs> so club mosses look like this in case you've seen some, uh, but ferns typically look like this and we'll see a few more later. The third thing to develop was the seed. And the first vascular plants with seeds evolved around 360 million years ago. So a seed consists of an embryo packed within a food supply and a protective coating. So think of all the seeds that you've seen before, right? So they've got that nice protective coating on the outside of them. So that way, you know, they're there. And we eat seeds. We typically eat seeds. And so do birds because they do have that food supply that's within them. So the birds are, birds feed off of it, we feed off of it, but it is supposed to supply the actual plant that would grow if the conditions were, were right. Okay. okay, so vascular plants with seeds include two things, the gymnosperms and the angiosperms. Gymnosperms are, they can be ginkgo, uh, cycads, or conifers. Really, you'll probably know the pine the best for this one as an example. And gymno actually refers to, it's, I, you know, you just have to look at it, but that one is actually called naked seeds. So the seeds kind of exist in a cone. So these are your, we call them conifers, so they have a cone. So in there, the seeds aren't actually surrounded by something else. They're kind of a little bit more naked. All right, angiosperms are going to be our flowering plants and grasses. Just grasses flower too. Sort of. All right. So there you go. A little bit more. Gymnosperms are naked seeds uh, that are not produced in special chambers. So they don't get produced in special chambers. Again, ginkgo, cycads, and conifers. We say conifer just because it, it's a cone bearer. And a simpler example is a pine. Right. So there you go. So you can see ginkgo, cycads, I think some in the classifying life, uh, the little table that we did. So a couple of people had ginkgos. 
ephedra, uh, different thing. But the really the big one that you know is the evergreen pine tree that would do it. Yeah, I know we're in 20 minutes. We're going to continue right along because we are close to the end here, believe it or not. All right, angiosperms are the other ones. These guys evolved around 140 million years ago, and these are all flowering plants. It actually inclu includes grasses. Is there really anything lovely that you think of that you draw a picture of? <laughs> I'm drawing the most awful pictures ever, by the way, just for entertainment value at this point. But anything that you can think of that you draw a nice little picture of. I know that's terrible, but just, you know, use your imagination. That's what it's for. So any of those beautiful things are considered angiosperms. Look, we'll do a sunflower. Right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. I love that. Just I gave you the examples just because it's more silly. Like this is supposed to be some crazy tulip. But you could do like tulips, orchids. I'm giving you easier example. Sunflowers. Roses. How do we forget roses? Okay. And, the, you know, it, we'll say et cetera on that one. And then I love this. I tell you all those just because this is the example your book gives you. Uh, the jacaranda tree, because I'm, I'm absolutely positive that you knew exactly what that was. As soon as you saw it, you're like, oh, my God, it's a jacaranda tree. Knew it. And then a green foxtail, because you've seen those, too. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But you've seen grass, and around here we have St. Augustine grass and Bermuda grass and things like that. All those grasses and wheats and other things that sort of produce fruit. That's the other thing that I meant to give you here is the fruit bearers too. They produce fruit. Those things are also angiosperms. So all the pretty things are angiosperms. Done. Okay. And that's it. Next time, so this is your heads up, next time we have to talk about alternation of generation. And it will make both of us sad, but we're going to work through it as best we can. So uh, that's all we have for this one, just a nice introduction to the plant section. So if you have any questions or you need to figure out anything else, shoot me an email, we'll, we'll get it together. <laughs>